we're uh, trying to convene, uh, uh, Jim Mazo has a panel later, he's calling Masters of the Universe. We're gonna call this Guardians of the Galaxy here. And these really are the people that can take us into the next generation of intraocular lenses. And this is really one of the missing pieces in our armamentarium in ophthalmology. We have incredibly high-tech approaches, femtosecond lasers, et cetera, for doing cataract surgery. But the actual IOL hasn't changed that much since back in the day in the 80s when I was learning to do cataract surgery. It's still basically a slight variation on the piece of the Spitfire cockpit that was the first IOL. And what we're going to see here, which Dick has done a nice job of summarizing, is how we're now going into a real change where we're seeing a lot of very new technology that approaches this in very different directions for solving the biggest unsolved problem, uh, presbyopia. So what I might do is start with our, our guest panel here that needs no, no introduction, is just on a personal level, given what's available today, what lens would you have, if you had to have cataract surgery, would you put into your eye? And, and I've checked with all the CEOs here, and it's okay, you can use someone else's product, it's no big deal, but it's, a, it's an everyday question for a patient. And maybe Cal, you could you start off on that. Well, I've actually thought about this a lot, about what kind of lens I would want in my eye. And I know personally that I don't want any glare. I don't want any halos. I don't want any dysphotopsia. I don't want any decre decrease in contrast sensitivity. But I do want to have a, a range of vision. And so for my eye, what I would like would be a crystal lens. Or if I have astigmatism, uh, a true line torque. Because it's the only lens on the market that is going to have no of these dysphotopsias, but still give me an extended range of vision. Jack, maybe since you're the only person who could explain some of the optics of these IOLs, what, what would you do in today's world? Well, uh, you know, I go through the same list that Cal does. I don't want any glare. I don't want any halos. I want high contrast. I want depth perception. I want everything. And I would get monovision. The thing that Dick shows, uh, you know, if you're targeted for about minus one and a quarter, one and a half, and you're minus a quarter in the dominant eye for distance, your depth perception is still excellent. You can read up close. You can see at distance. You've got no halos. And the biggest thing is you'd think it'd affect your depth perception, but at one and a quarter, it doesn't. So you still have that. And that's, I think, why doctors and patients still today, that's the most common modality because it is the one that gives the clearest vision without any uh, visual disturbances. Okay. Laurent? Well, you know, um, so I'll try to avoid the bias, obviously. But uh, having worked in IOLs uh, personally, I'm going to be a little more demanding than my colleagues here on the side here because I'm not going to just ask for the best optics, uh, which I think that uh, if I needed astigmatism, I would definitely go to a toric lens because we've demonstrated that uh, that has uh, delivered some really nice corrections. But in order to do that, right, you have to have the right biomechanics, meaning that the lens have to have the stability and the right design in order to deliver that great quality optics. So I would upgrade from just looking at optical quality to biomechanical qualities, but then I wouldn't stop here again and I would look at the biomaterial because I want to avoid also things like PCO or ACO and, and therefore I would be very uh, selective as well as to what the material looks like. So in, 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 in short words, it's biomaterial, the, the mechanics, and then the optics. Great. Malvina? Well, obviously, I think every lens that's on the market today is reasonably safe and effective. Otherwise, it wouldn't be on the market. <laughs> Having said that, I think each category of IOLs offers a unique um, perspective, a unique set of benefits. And I think patient selection is the ultimate um, challenge for each kind of IOL, but I do believe that all of them work. Okay. So you'd take one in one eye and two in the other? And the other. Hopefully uh, I'm not there yet. Uh, Jane? Well, I'll be going on. Uh, I'd go on a medical uh, holiday, I'm afraid, because the uh, product that I would choose is not on the market. It's in investigational 
uh, work right now in clinical, and it would be the symphony, and probably the symphony toric, because I have a little bit of astigmatism. Great, great. Well, what's good is hopefully we'll have more choices, and we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Now, one thing that I noticed in the discussion before this panel was there was a lot of back and forth about what to call the need for these things, my reading glasses. And so maybe I'd let Malvina opine on our, on our next question, which is, and I won't use the P word, but what is the preferred nomenclature for this? So, and Gil, why is it a big deal that it's not presbyopia? So Gil is referring to my reaction when I was invited to discuss presbyopia correcting IOLs. My first reaction was there are none because no IOL is approved for correcting presbyopia. All of the IOLs in the United States are approved for correction of aphakia secondary to removal of a cataract. Now, some IOLs offer additional benefit, in the, which is uh, vision at near or intermediate distances. Uh, and I believe that's what you wanted this panel to focus on. <laughs> All right, we'll try, to, we'll try to color between the lines on, on that one. Uh, so maybe the, these next couple questions I'm going to give to Jack, and I'm, I'm violating a prime rule of being a moderator is never let your panelists have slides. But on these next couple questions, because they're about some very complicated optics, I thought we would talk about how to define these extended depth of focus IOLs and how are they different. And I have a couple of your slides, which I can just advance for you if you'd like yeah, for, yeah, for this. So. Go ahead and click up to that next slide, because that's the uh, second slide there. there we go. Uh, th I think this is the best example to look at for an extended depth of focus, and that is that what you see here is that rather than bringing the light rays to a perfect point, uh, it actually can expand that focal point to a zone where you get good focus over that entire zone. Now, the next slide shows Actually, that, do you want to go back to the previous slide or yeah i want yeah. to go to the next I think, one yeah uh, advance it one okay Let's and go. one more just so i can show it graphically okay great and that's this there's no such thing as uh everything's a trade-off you've only got a bundle of rays coming through that come to a perfect focus and if you put that over an area or a region well, then obviously uh, you've defocused some of those rays that were at a perfect point to a range of vision. So there's no way, for example, that curve that's in blue is a typical aspheric monofocal lens. And along the bottom we have defocus and along the vertical axis is visual acuity and logmar. And what you see is we've come up with extended depth of focus lenses have to have three criteria. Uh, so far in the task force that we worked at. And the first is that that peak can be no more than one line different from the monofocal control. So you can't lose more than one line of vision with an extended depth of focus, and it has to be less than that for a 100-patient sample. The second thing that it has to do is that area that's light blue on the right is what we benefit from with an extended depth of focus lens. And so uh, this is not a specific lens, it's just sort of a diagram of what probably is gonna be the best uh, extended depth of focus without sacrificing anything at the peak. So that whole blue region over there is a benefit. And the second criteria is gonna be that in order to be defined as an extended depth of focus, it has to be more than a half a diopter greater than the monofocal lens at 2030 vision, which is Logmar 2 tense. And then the third thing is gonna be that at least 50% of the patients have to have better than uh, 2030 vision uh, uncorrected at 67 centimeters which is uh, a diopter and a half. So those three things then will define what we mean by an extended depth of focus lens. Okay, great. Well, and let's, let's talk about accommodating also, which has been around for a little longer, but also I think we should probably talk right. in some detail. And then the accommodating lens is uh, simpler. The accommodating amplitude that we talk about is the uh, difference between the refractive power at the eye when you're looking at distance or at the near point. Now for clinicians, what that means is 
when you're looking at uh, infinity in your Plano, that is your emetropic, it means that if I were to take a refractometer and have you look at something that was at uh, one diopter or one meter in front of you, that the auto refractor would measure you as one diopter of myopia. Now there's a depth of field that Dick mentioned in there, like when you have a pinhole and our pupil gets smaller when we look close up. So that smallness of the pupil increases our depth of field. So the typical monofocal lens, as you saw on that defocus curve, really, as he said, has about 2040 vision when you look up close at about 67 centimeters because you get about three quarters of a diopter of depth of field from a monofocal lens when you look up close. The accommodating lens has to be at least, and this is still uh, with ISO and ANSI and in our task force, something that has not been finalized, but right now it has to be more than one diopter more than in terms of the change in power than you'd get with the monofocal lens. So if it was plus 75 with the monofocal, it'd have to be 175 uh, with an accommodating lens. And then that goes on that we'd like you to prove that with UBM, that with ultrasound, or on an auto refractor. But those are things that are work in progress right now. Great. Well, that's great detail. But now the question is, does the FDA concur with any of this? And how does this play out with you, Melvin? Well, I never say no to Jack. <laughs> <laughs> say that a little louder, Melvin, would you? Um, Dick very eloquently summarized the history of IOLs, and multifocals were obviously the first IOLs that provided me a vision. For them, we have both ISO and an ANSI standards that are recognized by the FDA. For those of you who don't know, ISO and ANSI are independent organizations, but by process of recognition, we acknowledge that we accept the criteria um, and the recommendations for assessment in the standards. So for multifocals, the, uh, that's why I believe Jack never bothered putting it on the slides. It's a sort of a done deal. It's a well-established definition. We all accepted it. We have recognized the standards. Now next came accommodatings. Um, and as Jack alluded to it, there are two standards, ISO and ANSI. They have a little bit of a difference right now in <laughs> their definitions. ISO has finished and it's published, but ANSI is still in the process of trying to get published. Once the two of them get published, we will decide which parts of which documents we recognize, and that ultimately will be the definition that FDA recognizes. So it's a very long answer to say almost there. But, and, but what, is the, what are the two values? One. So one, they're both one diopter, but one compares it to a monofocal control, and then the other standard talks about it as being as an independent criteria. So that's the little difference. Now, as far as EDOF, um, this jumps to the second part of the question. EDOF was not uh, in any public domain as far as uh, discussions for the criteria prior to the workshop, which we were very fortunate to hold together with AAO about a year ago, we developed a workshop especially aimed at uh, expediting getting premium IOLs to market. And one of the key things we accomplished at the workshop is we introduced a brand new category of IOLs, extended depths of focus. And we were able to come up with a definition, part of the definition that Jack just alluded to. Um, at that workshop. Subsequent to our workshop, ANSI, American National Standard Institute, was able to pick up our inertia and actually start a standard, and there's a nice draft of an ANSI standard that is currently being uh, circulated and worked upon. Um, also, for those of you who weren't aware of it, the AAO task force is under great leadership of Jack. Uh, is making terrific progress on trying to address the remaining issues uh, and defin finalizing definitions of EDOF that Jack alluded to a result of that. Great, great. Well, maybe we'll move from semantics to real products and talk about the most exciting thing, which is what are the next things coming down the pipeline? Because I think we all see we've had limited options, particularly in the U.S. A lot of them are trade-offs, involve a lot of patient selection. And maybe, Laurent, you could start with just some of the very exciting things that are pretty near-term that are coming from the variety of companies out there. 
Well, you know, when it comes to that particular space, I I'm excited in a, a portfolio approach because nothing right now today can be the panacea uh, product. But um, as Dick gave us the history about uh, the splitting light, really, of IOLs and the multifocals, I think that there's a, a lot of things that we've learned and that is not a one-size-fits-all, right? And then, therefore, having a portfolio approach to that is very logical. Uh, whether we talk about different distances or powers, you know, let it be a 4.0, which probably gives you a great near vision and more intermediate with the 3 and more distance with the 2.5s and things like that. But also, you know, uh, whether it's bifocal or trifocal, all of those things which we, Alcon, actually are, are one, have, and are, so we'll be coming uh, out very soon this year with a, uh, in Europe with a, uh, with a trifocal version. So we believe in this portfolio approach because it's really not a one-size-fits-all. Secondarily, I think there's all the mechanically accommodative lenses, right, which we've seen this morning a lot of examples that are also very exciting. And since we, we are a bit agnostic to where we look for technology, whether it's outside or, or internal, uh, we're very interested in, in the progress in the accommodative. And then there's a third and final one, which is really associating some of the materials with electronics. And, and so this is where you probably all heard about the, the Google partnership that we were able to do. And, and we're working uh, on the association of electronics, uh, which brings a whole new area of autofocus and how to turn that into mimicking exactly what the lens does today, or our natural lens does today through its, uh, its movement. So those are the three areas where I, I, I strongly believe that we still have some, a lot of excitement, the, uh, the splitting the light, the multifocality, the, the mechanical accommodation, and then the association of, a, of, a, of really cutting edge electronics into and marrying that with the, the right materials. Interesting. Maybe Cal and Jane, you, you could comment too from a corporate standpoint what you, what you guys are excited about. I think uh, Laurent's comments about the portfolio really strike home, but if you take a look at uh, where the industry was 10 years ago, there was a proliferation of a lot of small companies that were working on a lot of different technologies in correcting for presbyopia to provide patients the full functional vision of distance near and um, intermediate. Recession hit. Um, and all of a sudden there was a drop off in terms of a lot of the newer technologies that were out there, which was really unfortunate to see. All of a sudden now, with the companies that you saw this morning, there seems to be a resurgence of, of innovation in the space, which is gratifying. And some of them um, have actually taken some of the learnings from prior technologies and are starting to repurpose them in terms of taking that understanding into a next generation approach. So all of them collectively, to me, suggest that there's going to be a greater opportunity for patients, as well as their physicians, in terms of providing different options for patients, because these lenses are now starting to come out beyond just multifocality, beyond just the axial accommodation, shape changing, electronics, a lens type technology. So it's all very, very exciting to see. I, I can echo Jane's comments. We're actually inundated with applications for new and novel premium IOLs, and that was one of the um, reasons we held the workshop, is because so many different companies are trying to get into that space. We felt that some kind of a guidance that can be applicable and help all of those uh, sponsors is needed. Well, quick 510K process for all of them. Check the box. Have no, okay. I had to try. Uh, Cal, do you want to get yeah, started? If, if there's one, one thing that, that seems to be in common of the companies that we heard about this morning is that they don't split the light in order to give distance intermediate and near. And so I really think that's the future. And just speaking for Bausch and Lomb, our interest is in new technology that doesn't split light but, but allows all of the light to be used at every distance, depending on what, what the patient's looking at. Jack? Well, you know, I agree 100%, and I think that we're on a journey. And in the short term, in the next two, three years, you'll see that EDOF lenses and some of the mechanical lenses that you've seen this morning and others that have been submitted that use either fluidics or the ciliary body or something will definitely uh, change uh, and give us uh, another step along the way of correcting presbyopia that gets rid of the halo and glare and gives us intermediate and almost near vision. Now the other area that's uh, possible and is certainly been uh, breadboarded and works is the electronic 
in which it actually has, you can change the index of refraction by running a current through, which can be controlled by the pupil. And so electronically, you can get up to two, two and a half, three diopters of change in power, like an autofocus camera, where a person looks at distance and they look up close. So I think we're about two to three years away of another interim step where we're getting better, get intermediate with no halos, and within the next five to seven to eight years, we'll actually have an accommodation that's up to the three or four diopters of accommodation without the halos and glare, and we'll have solved the problem for 90%, 99% of being able to see that plus four 25 centimeters. And once we do that, that's the holy grail. Yeah, but, but I think one of the things that actually has changed is the definition of near vision. Yes. Okay, because, because near vision used to be the ability to read a newspaper. Yes. And that's not how people read anymore. People read with their electronic device, which is usually held a little bit further. And so that need for three, three diopters of near vision is probably not as great today as it was in, in the past. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that, I, but I'll tell you this. If you look at my little smartphone right now and you look at the size of that print, if you don't hold it at 25 centimeters, I can't see that little bitty date down there any longer. You've got yours set on extra large bold. Mine's set on regular size print, and so I can't see it. So I've got to hold it at 25 centimeters. So it's still going to end up that you've got to be at plus four in order to be able to read normal size print like the kids do and be able to see that little bitty print that's on the calendar without bumping the font size up to extra large. Show him how to change the settings. I will. I will. <laughs> that's great. Well, why don't we shift a little bit? I'm going to go back to our first class compartment here. This is Coach over here. These guys are over in first class. So. So, um, Jane, maybe talk a little bit about, we, we touched on this, but the build versus buy, there's a lot of fantastic projects going on within companies, but there's also all these startup companies and a resurgence, how maybe you, you look at that. Well, I think every uh, strategic has a slightly different approach towards it, but there's some fundamental points that I think all companies take into consideration, and I think it starts with um, your current portfolio and potential gaps in that portfolio that might exist taking a strategic assessment of where you are in the competitive landscape versus others that are out there is the first step in determining whether you're going to try and innovate your way and catch up or buy your way in through a transaction. Uh, the next key point that most companies will consider has to do with the uh, patent landscape and it's critically important. Um, many, many areas are extremely crowded when it comes to innovation and being able to carve out a proprietary position, not only to have freedom to operate, but also to be able to protect the technology that you're investing in, is part of that um, decision-making process that companies go through. Time to market, critically important. If you're way behind, the only way to catch up may, in fact, be to acquire your way into that technology. Um, your technical competency as well, if you have the engineering, the scientific team, in place capable of being able to innovate versus um, buy-in. Obviously, if you can do your own innovation, um, the financial returns are usually far greater. If you have to acquire, generally you're paying a premium because you're coming in late and you're obviously having to buy a product that has been somewhat de-risked depending upon the stage that it is. Um, by the company that you're buying from it. So in general, those are the key points that you generally take into consideration in terms of looking at a make versus buy type strategy. Great. Any other corporate comments here, Laurent or Sure, I, I'm, I'm, I can add that, um, I think I mentioned before, we're fortunate at Alcon, honestly, in the domain of IOLs that we, we have a rich you know, uh, heritage and a lot of wonderful scientists that have uh, uh, really delivered a lot of great innovations over the years. but. Um, but truly, we're interested in the innovation wherever, wherever it comes from. And, and so uh, I think we, we've demonstrated that uh, with a lot of companies that are here, uh, whether we talk about LensX or we talk about uh, WaveTag. But even in IOLs, we're, 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 we're partnering um, with a lot of companies to, to add to our existing uh, depth of knowledge, really, internally. And so um, perhaps the perception was not the case before at Alcon, but uh, I can tell you that recently, and when, with new leadership as well, we've, we've really taken an agnostic type of position as to where the technology comes from, even in spaces where we historically have had really great depth of, uh, of knowledge. 
Well, my answer is much quicker. We are, we are buyers. And, and so you, you got to hear from, from Mike Pearson. You know that we're impatient. Uh, we're looking for great te technology. We're, we're buyers. Great. Mike and Cal, they'll be in the networking room out there. Anybody out there? See, see what you can do. Um, why, don't, why don't we go to a question? This is one that I personally am interested in because a lot of my companies are trying to commercialize something outside the U.S. with the idea it's going to be ultimately big in the U.S. market. And the question is, does the, does the outside U.S. experience predict what will happen in the U.S.? Or how do you correlate non-U.S. experience with, with U.S.? And uh, Laurent, I think you have a lot of experience in this area. Maybe you can start on that. Yeah, so, I, so I had a chance to, um, to market products or run um, areas of uh, the world, like in Europe. But uh, I think it has a great relevance, actually, because uh, depending on the timing and when, where product gets uh, approved, I can tell you in the multifocal experience, we, we learn through... Um, commercialization, because it's a much wider um, adoption than the, than the clinical trials, uh, that, for example, a four-ad team tended to be a bit too close or, or really putting uh, really great uh, sh uh, short uh, reading, but maybe we, there was a need out there for uh, intermediate vision. So hence why we started to take a, a portfolio approach in terms of multifocality. But I think we also have to be sensitive with some cultural differences and lifestyle differences around the world. And I can tell you, for example, even if I associate that with an example in marketing, um, when, we, when you look at uh, lower um, power lenses, which do give you better distance, right? Well, then you, it was funny because I was looking at some marketing approaches for the U.S. And, and looking at golfer type of pictures or things, which is very common in the United States, but not so much in, in Europe, right? So when you, so perhaps the cultural differences in lifestyle actually affect which product is going to be uh, more relevant to that culture and that lifestyle. And I would, I would tend to see, and we'll, we'll see what the results that the 2.5 might be um, um, a more adopted in the U.S. because of the lifestyle of, of, uh, of people that are, uh, you know, the type of activity they're engaging in than in Europe, for example. So we do learn tremendously uh, from uh, having our products uh, globally and then, and then really uh, try to adapt to the, and provide the solutions for all the different lifestyles out there. Well, I believe you do learn from experience outside. I would like to challenge the established thinking. Um, I don't think in today's day and age it makes sense to go OUS first. I think if you want to get to market in US expeditiously, you come to us first, and we help you conduct your very first trial in the United States. This way you don't have to go outside and figure out if it was helpful or not. You can do it the right way from the beginning. And we have a brand new program called Early Feasibility Study, especially designed to help people conduct first-of-a-kind trials in the U.S. And I'm very happy to uh, announce that I have now two dedicated individuals in my division who's, who will answer any inquiries within 48 hours, help people hold their hands through the process, and make sure that the U.S. becomes the place to do the first trials in the world. Great, great. Great. We, we want to see that. Uh, why don't we go, I think we just have time for one, one more question, which is uh, kind of a, more, a slightly more complex one, which is we've talked a lot about IOLs, but there's also the idea is that, that these solutions could be combination solutions. And maybe just some, some quick reactions here to, do you guys see this as being something that is going to be viable? and I'm afraid to ask the regulatory strategy for this, but uh, just the general concept that there might be combinations of different technologies that would ultimately give a solution rather than a freestanding IOL. Well, there's no question clinically that uh, the combination of IOLs and lasers if, is one that's already being used by clinicians all the time because if you don't hit right on the button and you don't correct the astigmatism perfectly, well, sometimes the combination of using a laser procedure where you don't have to go back in the eye is definitely something that uh, we know. You get a 97, 98% success rate in terms of being within plus or minus a half a diopter. And so fine tuning an IOL procedure where it didn't come out just right is done today all the time. Uh, inlays, as you saw, they'll have small apertures and uh, revision. Uh, that type of procedure, I think, will also have a combination to work. Uh, scleral implants, I'm a little bit uh, reticent about because 
over time, the ciliary body seems to fade. Those don't seem to do that much over time. And so I'm not uh, a big advocate of scleral implants. Anyone else? Strong? Well, Laura? Sure. Uh, as surgeons, is not something that we think about a lot. But if you want to know about an area of ophthalmology where there's tons of innovation, it's actually in contact lenses. And that the new multifocal and diffractive and extended depth of, of field contact lenses are extraordinary and incredibly comfortable and daily disposable. And so um, the, as a surgeon, we always think we have to fix everything. But actually, for people who have worn contact lenses in the past, that may actually turn out to be a great option to give people all the range of vision they want. That's great. great. I cannot agree more with, uh, with Cal, because we have obviously a, a lot of presence in the contact lens side. So I, I, I truly agree with that. But I think that you know, as it is reflected with the, the portfolio that Alcon has assembled over the years, which is really broader in ophthalmology, we think that there's actually a, a great benefits to a system approach, obviously. And so that's why we are all, you know, very active also in the laser refractive uh, space uh, for some of the things that the Jack was mentioning, right? So um, a system approach, because ultimately what we're aiming for is the best refractive outcomes. And so, uh, and sometimes you need a system approach to that. So that's, that's why we're, we're truly believers. Great. I think we're just about out of time, so thank you, panel. This was great, and we appreciate it. And uh, Emmett will come up next. Thank you.